everybody. It's of uh, that that time, and we want to welcome everybody to Rabbi and Friends. And uh, we're glad you're here. We have uh, our crew back with us, and uh, we're excited uh, as usual to get together with our dear friends and anybody who's willing to participate, who's anxious to learn about the Word of God. And uh, so uh, there's really nothing more exciting than that. And uh, we just wish that there are a lot more people that would decide that uh, that they would they, they were seeking a biblical worldview. And uh, that's really important because without that, without that, they're missing everything. Anyway, we're uh, we're going to pray and uh, and then we're going to hop into a brief moment with. Uh, this week's parasha, Kititze, and uh, one second, okay, and uh, Miss Rebecca is joining us. Um, so, uh, Abba, we just come before you right now. We praise you, we thank you, we lift you up. Lord, we, uh, we know that there's much in store for us this day, Lord, and there's so much going on around us, and we need your word ever present in our lives, Lord so that we can always come back to the word to help us understand what's going on around us. Uh, the Brit uh, Hadasha, the new covenant portion this week was Matthew 25 or the end of 24, actually, uh, where they're talking about the signs that Yeshua said we should be looking for. Well, they're upon us. They're upon us loud and clear. And so we just praise you and we thank you. Lord, we look forward every day to what you're going to do. And Lord, there are incredible stories about what things that are going on around us daily that prove that you are who you say you are. Yeah. So we lift you up and we, we are excited to see what the Ruach, what the Holy Spirit has in mind for us this day. And for anybody that needs any healing, Lord, you know exactly who that is. And we ask for your touch. And we pray all this and we ask for your presence, your Ruach, your Ruach HaKodesh to be present as we speak your words this day. In Yeshua's name, amen, amen, and amen. amen. Good morning, all. Glad you're with us. Any God stories? Chuck, I know you were off with family. Any uh, thing you'd like to share with us about your trip? Well, I have, I got to uh, continuing uh, sharing the gospel with my nephew, Sam. Uh, very, very important. Uh, so I, I had spent a few hours with him uh, alone, uh, sharing a lot about uh, the Lord and uh, how he wants to be involved in his life. Uh, so I would like to pray if, when we get a chance for Sam, but uh, it, was a, it was a very blessed time. Uh, we saw God move in amazing ways. I have a cousin who's a driven evangelist. He's actually a second cousin. He's my cousin's son. And uh, we went to visit, well, we went to a place called Medina, where we used to spend our Sundays with the family. It's a very small town in below, below Buffalo by about 40 miles. We went every single week, and uh, we were very, very close. You know, there was about 60 people in a one-room uh, apartment. You know, it was actually a two-bedroom wow. house. It was very, very small, and uh, we all went there. Anyway. Uh, we went to a couple of graveyards and visited some of the relatives. And as we were leaving, we, we, we didn't find many of the ones we wanted to find. It was raining. And it was raining hard. And so uh, we were going to stop at one of the restaurants that our family owned. So I called this second cousin and asked him to come and meet us for lunch. And he said he would, but he was quite a distance away. Well, uh, when we got to the restaurant, we got there first. Uh, it was closed. So we called them and told them it was closed and thought, you know, well, we're just going to take off and go back to Buffalo. And he said, well, uh, I know where some of the graveyard gravestones are that uh, you might have missed. Uh, I'm willing to come back in and, or come in and go to the cemetery. Well, my cousin who had flown in from Utah, I was with him and his son, uh, Chrissy and I and their wives. Anyway, he took us to a couple of graveyards and we were amazed. We saw uh, graves that brought back extreme memories from when we were children, but also 
took us to another graveyard. And here is my cousin Frankie, who's from Utah. He came in from Utah. His brother, Sammy, next to him is the grave for Frankie's mother. Frankie just recently, about a year ago, came to faith in Christ at our, at our table here in the kitchen. Well, when he saw his mother's grave, he had no idea where she was buried, and he hadn't known since 1978 or something wow. where she was. And he fell down on his knees, and he just started weeping that he had finally found his mother's grave. It was such a God moment. It was just a miracle. Because we weren't going to meet Joey. Then the restaurants closed. And it's raining. Everything. And, and it's, it's raining. Cold. All these things are happening to keep us from it. And we get there. I mean, I got goosebumps on me right now just thinking about it. Wow. And if, if it wasn't for God, it would never have happened. But it was one of those wonderful moments. There was much more, but I'll just end with that. Uh, it, it was a blessed time. We Amen. saw God in wonderful ways. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Mr. Good morning. Everybody's here. Rebecca, can you hear us? Because you're muted. Guys, you're muted. Uh, give me a thumbs up. Give me something. Good morning. I can hear yes. you. Okay, great. Welcome. I can hear you too. All, All right. right. Good. Okay. <laughs> great. Okay. Um, another God story. I know most of you know this. If you've been seeing all the <clears throat> Good Morning America then the one on NBC6 the other day about Jameson Reader. It's been unbelievable. Unbelievable. The, coverage. the last one, if you haven't seen it, let me know and I can uh, send you the clip uh, where uh, the doctor comes on and explains what exactly happened, how severe the uh, injury was. Let me, get, let me get graphic for a minute. How many have ever had a chicken wing? Okay, you know when you bite down on those chicken wings, okay, not the drumstick part, but the other part, there are two bones. Okay, that's what was left of that leg of when that. the shark got done with it. Okay, Actually, he had stripped it, it like a chicken wing. He had gotten through the skin, gotten through the muscle, and had already gnawed on the bone. Uh, one bone gone and not on the other one. So anyway, the doctor gave the, you know, about, he spoke about the condition when he first saw him. And then the, um, the rescue, uh, the young guy in the rescue who took him into the rescue vehicle tells the story of what happened. Uh, how many of you did not see this? Did not. Okay. I'll send it to you. It's on national news. Uh, and very quickly, I'll tell you, he gets on there and he talks about the fact that he brought him into the uh, into the rescue vehicle. And he said, you know, he was in, in a certain shock. degree, of course, of shock, which is uh, normal. And he said, but the, the young boy was talking and he said he had to lean over to uh, put the IV in, lean over his body. And I guess as he leaned over his body, his uh, necklace, his necklace fell out of his shirt, the EMT. And he said, all of a sudden, Jameson looked at him and he right in the eyes. Now this is, imagine this, this is after he's got a shark attack. And he looks at him and he says, are you a Christian? This is to the, to the rescue guy. And the rescue guy said, is, is saying, I, I, I don't know why this boy was asking me if I was a Christian. He said, uh, after he just had his leg bitten off or whatever, he said, but I said to him, well, he said, I'm, I'm Catholic. I'm not a Christian. That, those were his words. I don't know where he, where he got that misnomer. But anyway, um, he said, I'm Catholic. I'm not a Christian. But if you want me to be Christian right now, I'll be Christian for you. And then he realized that the reason why Jameson had asked that question is because his cross had flipped out of his shirt. And he said that he instantly realized that there was something totally special about this young man and, the, and, and what was going on. And he said in all his, uh, his career, he's never been so moved and so changed by an individual in his whole life. And he will never, ever forget that. 
And then it goes into Jameson Amazing. talking about his prosthetic leg, uh, uh, prosthetic leg he's going to get. And he's just so up and positive. But he's I mean, use... talk about a God story. Oh, my gosh. He's going to use him in such a way. Oh, um, he already is. Oh, he already yeah, is. Yeah, already I'm is. Profoundly. He doesn't send that to me because I didn't see the whole thing. Yeah. yeah. And the doctor was talking about telling him that he was going to get a prosthetic leg. And he's all excited because he said the doctor who's going to give it to him said that this particular uh, leg has like a cushion at the bottom oh, of it. Oh, he said, spring. like a spring. He said, so foot. you're going to be able to play basketball and jump higher than anybody else. And he's all excited about that. But the, <laughs> his attitude. And then, of course, there's the other clip where uh, his father talks about when he pulled him out of the water and he put him in his arms and, and Jameson said, Jesus. So. Absolutely astounding. I, read, whole, I did read about it, but I didn't see the video, but I did read uh, about uh, that. I'll, I'll send you both. testimony yeah. is amazing. For Absolutely saying. amazing. And to think that we were, uh, we were both with him like week a week, week before this all happened. It was just unreal. Anyway, yeah. I'll send it to you. Thank you. you this is Rebecca. Could you send it to me too, please? Yeah, sure, sure. Thank you. Absolutely. Just to, to tag onto that, um, for those who, with the family, the lineage, um, the, his his dad is James Jameson, and his granddad is Bob Reader, officially called Bobby Reader, who was a choir director at First Baptist Church for decades. And when that pageant started, um, hit. Bob Reeder, Pastor O.S. Hawkins that a lot of people are now seeing on TBN, they were they were in leadership to open up the pageant, bring it to Fort Lauderdale. Um, now, one other just side silly story about this, and it, it just reminds me of how much First Baptist was family and my family, my blood family came to understand us as family. Years ago, when the boys were little, the, the dad, Jameson, and they got two other sons, but they were all little. We were the pageant was being done at um, Memorial War Memorial. War Memorial, and one year a, a benefactor decided to bring a bunch of talent in, and one of the people he brought in to, for this world special because that year it was broadcast over the world. One of the people he brought in was Johnny Cash, so they brought Johnny Cash in, and they wanted they were going to have him speak, and they wanted a family setting around him just different groups of people sitting in families. So they're sitting there and this one guy, John Morgan, who used to be help, one of the helpers there, looking around, setting up the families. And he knew me from singles and he looks at me and he yells, Alita, grab some kids, get a family. And, with the, and because we were silly friends away from church, I totally forgot we were in public. And I said to him, which one of them looks like me? Because at that time, I was one of the few Black people in church. So he pulls his Rita boys and sends them over to sit with me. So Jameson was one of my children <laughs> as we sat on the stage for Johnny Cash. But again, my the fact that I could say that and the whole stage cracked up, the fact that they found kids that looked like me in that setting was a beautiful thing. That's, again, when that church was family and has still is so all of you still family so looking through of, god's eyes Belita. they were looking through god's eyes we are family <laughs> That's Amen. A fact. David. Amen. praise the lord <laughs> yeah there's a lot of pageant history there a lot of uh you know my whole ministry evolved out of that it was really the thing that kicked off my ministry out of the pageant so anyway and of course uh Interestingly enough, with the passing of uh, Tim Donahoe a couple of weeks ago, um, we were at that uh, celebration of life by who was one of the speakers, but Les Shoveldayoff, okay, who used to work with Tim. So we had a little reunion of sorts at that uh, meeting. Larry Thompson preside, presided at that uh, meeting. So it was interesting last weekend. So um, anyway. God works in mysterious ways. Anyway, go with me to Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 21. Deuteronomy 21, 10. 
Here's Miss Rebecca. Um, and Deuteronomy 21.10 is the parasha called Kititse. Kititse. And if you look at the very first line, what does it say? Anybody? What does the first line say? When you go out to war against your enemy. When we go out, when you go out. Okay, that's what Kititse is. Okay, and um, this week's Haftorah portion is in the book of Isaiah, and the Brit Hadashah portion, the New Covenant, is in the book of Matthew. Matthew, of course, in Hebrew is Matatyahu, 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 Matthew. Anybody know what Matthew means in Hebrew, Matatyahu? A lover of dogs? No, that's it means Caleb, gift, sorry. gift of God. Oh, okay. Gift of God. And you should know that because you have a son by that name. Anyway. Okay. <laughs> I was going to name him Caleb, though. <laughs> oh, okay. Middle name. Yeah. Anyway, but this week's portion of scripture is particularly profound because four of the 613 commandments contained in the Torah. Uh, everything that, uh, you know, things about criminal, civil, family laws, as well as moral and religious duties of all the Israelites. But uh, the thing that caught my mind this week was something uh, that people generally use to throw in the face uh, of people who are believers. And Deuteronomy 21, 22, and 3 says, if a man is guilty of a capital offense, is put to death, and you hang him on a tree, his corpse shall not remain on the tree overnight. You must bury it the same day. Anyone who is hanged on a tree is cursed of God. Any thoughts on that subject? Well, in my, in my research, obviously, um, within Judaism, Yeshua of Nazareth, Jesus of Nazareth, has often been known by the name Talui. Talui or El Talui, uh, Ha Talui, not El, excuse me, which literally translates means the hanged one, the hanged one or the crucified one. And as the Jewish people struggled under the attacks of the persecutions of the church, Talui, that name provided a, a rather inside joke, if you will. Who is Yeshua? He is Talui, the crucified one. And what does the Torah say? Talui is accursed by God. So they're saying, how could Yeshua <laughs> be the Messiah if he's cursed by God? Okay, that's what's thrown in the face of people who are, who are the anti-evangelists, if you will. Okay, so Deuteronomy 21 says, he was hanged as a curse by God. The passage explains why the name Talui, the hung one, became a common title for Yeshua among Jewish people. Writings, the implied negativity is sometimes combined with other unflattering descriptions. Um, but in general, Talui, and if you're using that at any point in time, T-A-L-U-I, Talui, refers to Yeshua, the crucified one, and the title comes from the Torah. He who is hanged, Talui is accursed by God. So the anti-evangelicals still invoke that passage today. And the joke goes all the way back to the earliest years of the Yeshua movement uh, as the apostles proclaimed Christ crucified within the Jewish community. The early detractors who resisted their message probably responded to the message, <laughs> Talui is accursed by God, the crucified one. He's a curse by God. Okay, so again, anything that they could do to find fault with what, that, what was being said. So opponents of the early believers used the passage to argue that Yeshua could not be Messiah, just as the anti-evangelists do today. Uh, they probably said, you see, he could not be the Messiah because 
he was hung on a tree and everyone who's hung on a tree is a curse by God. Surely the real Messiah is not a curse by God. Who was the most learned and vicious anti-Yeshua person ever? A guy named Paul of Tarsus. Initially, okay, he knew that passage. Rav Shaul, Paul, Rabbi Paul. He used it in his debates against early believers, followers of the way, if you will. <laughs> he used it in contempt of Yeshua, Ha Talui, the crucified one. So reflecting on that matter, Paul wrote in Corinthians, I make known to you that no one speaking of the spirit of God says Jesus is accursed. And no one can say Yeshua is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. He also brought it up in the book of Galatians. And in Galatians 3, Paul returned to that old anti-Yeshua Talui polemic naming and cited Deuteronomy 21, 22, and 23 in reference to Yeshua again. And the passage was always popular with the anti-Jesus crowd. But in Galatians 3, Paul puts a rather new spin on this. Praise the Lord. He said, the Shiach redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree, so that in Yeshua, the Messiah, the blessing of Abraham, might come to the Gentiles, that we might receive the promised Ruach, the Spirit, through faith. Nice and loud, Rebecca. Say it again, please. <laughs> amen. <laughs> That's a good place to say amen and hallelujah. Any questions about that? I mean, there's so much covered. Again, we talked about there are so many laws that are spoken about out of the, out of the 613 that are talked about in this section. Uh, it talks uh, about, yes, Verna. Blessings. Blessings. Yesterday I was speaking to my sister and um, she was upset with something that was said to her. And um, it came to me the reality that there is nothing that that person can do to pay for. Even if they you forgive, yes. But the greatest um, forgiveness experience comes from the Lord himself having done it way back before the foundations of the world was made. He had already gone ahead and done what needed, paid the penalty. And I am to exact a payment from John Smith no, it is not. Yes, there's restoration. Yes. But at that level, the pinnacle done already by the Savior who never did any wrong. I mean, I bow to you, O oh Lord. I thank you. I thank you. It is absolutely, is absolutely amazing that not only do we know intellectually that he paid the price for us. Yeah. For our sins. Experientially. But he was, he was crucified with yeah. heinous execution known to mankind. Yeah. Absolutely. And knowing full well that this Talui was, in fact, something that people would perceive of as being a curse by God. So it's, it, it's, it further deepens the understanding of the price that he paid for us. Amen. And, and, uh, cursed yeah. by God so that we would not be. Yeah. And so when somebody thinks they're cursing me, that doesn't weigh in at all. I don't have to get disturbed in my heart. Yep. What I need to do is focus upon that which has been done by Christ himself. Because they didn't call me Beelzebub. They didn't spit in my face. They didn't pull my beard, which I don't have. <laughs> you don't have <laughs> mock me. No. So it is, it is, I let you know what is in your heart towards me, God, and towards your neighbor. Oh, Lord. I, I, I. <laughs> yes, it is rich. Oh, my God. Thank you. 
Amen. Yeah, I mean, it goes on in this in this parish to talk about you know if yes, you go Lord. out into war, uh, yeah. and and oh. suppose you see among the captives a beautiful woman, and you desire her and you want to take her as your wife. Okay, you can do that, but she has to come into her home into your home. She has to get rid of her prisoner's clothing, and she has to be able to mourn for her family for a month before then you can go to her and become your, uh, she can become your wife. Okay, I mean, unbelievable details here. Suppose a man has two wives, it talks about, and one is loved and one is the other, and she has children by you, uh, the first one, but when, when something happens to you, usually you pass along your estate to the oldest child. Well, what if the oldest child is of the wife that you don't like? Okay, he's still the oldest child and still gets what is due him. Um, suppose you have a stubborn and rebellious son, a drunkard, so they say. Okay, What's he, what are you supposed to do with him? You're supposed to take him down for the two people. He's useless. He's no good. He's a drunkard. And everybody is to stone him to death. Whoa. What do you think about that? Can we do that? Could you do that to your child? So what is what is what are we missing here? And ultimately, to, to go ahead a few years, how, how do you think Jesus would respond to that? And again, there's a scene with him and rabbis who want to stone somebody. Right, and he said, "He who has the first uh, something like he who has the first sin, um, who is without sin, he is without sin, right? And the they first. all left because they all had something. Everyone is guilty of something, Precisely. so they weren't able to do that. And that's what I thought when you said that um, about the child. I thought about that um, that scripture in the Bible. Yeah, because so, Jesus was like, no." All right, so let's make it easy. Between, between the old covenant that we're reading now and the new covenant as brought to us by Yeshua the Messiah, because he wrote the old covenant as well, okay? But when, when the Lord sent him back to us after a 400-year span of time, what was the ultimate purpose of him coming back at that time? Be the Messiah. To be the Messiah? Die on the cross. In other words, the Lord sent him back because obviously we didn't get it. And he needed to send him back to spread his love. Up, I like to say to, to shuck it down to the cop. You didn't make <laughs> you didn't understand when I was here before, okay, or via my servant Moses or anybody else, even though we made it very clear through the Torah. But let me let me explain it to you. This is what I meant. This is how I want you to live. And so they weren't necessarily obedient. He was present. But we had the Father. And we had the, everything that was coming down through us, through the Father, through his servant Moses. But what was missing? Rebecca. Love and compassion. Okay, via That's what? one of the things that was missing. And, and he showed it when he came, when Jesus came, he showed love and compassion where they weren't understanding that part. So what's the key thing that we're missing here to be that love and compassion? Okay, Michael? In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit would come upon people at times. But when Jesus came, it was so that the Holy Spirit could abide with us all the time. Amen. Amen. So that's what is missing. The missing here, especially when it's saying stone somebody, stone your own child. How do we comprehend that? And this person, this guy interprets that as we're missing the spirit of the law. Mm -hmm. You need to be holy as I am holy. Okay, if there's if your child is being so misguided, misbehaved, maybe who does that fall back on? Maybe that falls on you. 
Okay, do you need to show compassion to that child? Okay, or do you need to stone him to death? Michael? Well, it's the goodness of God that leads men to repentance. But recall also, um, uh, excuse me, uh, Joseph, by the law, had every right to put Mary out. And yet he was a righteous man. He did not want to uh, make a public spectacle over it and, and was going to put her aside quietly until the Lord spoke to him. Yeah, the angel. the angel spoke to him. Yeah. And made it very clear. This is from me. Mm -hmm. you, you are free to go and take Mary as your bride. Miriam, her name was Miriam. Okay. And um, so again, the Lord is saying, you need to get rid of everything here that is not holy, uh, that is not pure. Because if, and, because if I am to be your God and you are to be my people, you need to rid yourself of every unclean thing, even if it means your own child. Okay, so you have a responsibility here. And there's something else that's missing a lot now. Okay. Then it goes on to talk about the thing that we just talked about of being hung on a tree. It talks about love and practice. You were to watch, you know, if, if your neighbor has an ox that gets lost and you happen to see it, okay, do you just walk by and forget about it because it's not yours? No, you got to go and take care of it. Your, your neighbor's ox, okay? A man's apparel, listen to this. A man's apparel is not to be on a woman nor a man to wear a woman's clothing for whoever does these things is detestable to Adonai your God. Hello. Where is that written? I'm reading it right here in this section. This is Deuteronomy 22, 5. That's a good one because there's a lot of that going on. <laughs> you think? <laughs> yeah. Okay, there's a community here right around the corner from us in Fort Lauderdale. What well, was it? Deuteronomy do what? All day long, every day. What? Deuteronomy 22, what? 22.5. 22.5. <laughs> Thank amazing. you. Everybody wants to know where that, that passage Chuck. is. Chuck. <laughs> no, that's, oh. good. that's good. Okay. Um, you are not to plow. Uh, you're not to plow your field with an ox and a donkey together. What does that tell you? You know, you put the donkey, you put the animals in a yoke to plow the field. Would you put a, a donkey with an ox? No. So what is that saying? What's the expression that we know now what to do? Be not unequally yoked. Thank uh -huh. you, Michael. Amen. Okay, if you put a donkey and an ox together, which way is the plow going to go? <laughs> Circles. I like that, Chrissy. That was cute. What did you do? <laughs> oh, okay. mm -mm. Donkey and an ox. Yeah. Too different. Mm. Too different. Mm. It talks about... Um, uh, do, 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 do. Um, you know, if, if a guy... If a man takes a woman as a wife, and then all of a sudden she displeases him, and she, he chooses to cast her out, and he says, uh, he takes a wife and goes to her and dislikes her, accuses her of shameful things and gives her a bad reputation because he's saying that she was not a virgin when they got married. Okay, so um, I took this woman, but when I came to her, I didn't find her virginity. Then father of the young woman is to take her and her mother and bring the signs of the young woman's virginity to the city elders to the gate. The young father is to tell, tell the elders, I gave my daughter uh, to this man's wife, but he hates her. Indeed, he has accursed her of shameful things saying, I didn't find your daughter's virginity. Yet these are the signs of my daughter's virginity. They are to spread the wedding cloth before the elders of the city the elders of the city are to take the man and punish him. Then they are to find him 100 pieces of silver. 
But of course, if in fact she was not a virgin at that particular point in time, found the young lady to not be a virgin, and the men of the city are to stone her with stones to death because she has done disgraceful thing in Israel. So you are to purge evil from your midst. Wow, okay. Times they are changing. Okay, and it goes on to talk about who should be excluded. It talks about uh, slavery and uh, cult, female and male prostitutes. All of these things need to be done away with. It talks about being uh, taking, making vows. And if you make a vow, okay, let, your, let it tr be true. It talks about marriage and divorce and giving a woman a get of divorce, a separation, a certificate of divorce. Uh, it goes on to talk about the relief of the poor and justice from the court. Okay, justice from the court needs to be two witnesses, not just one. Um, and the blotting out of Amalek. Who was Amalek? Anybody remember? Weren't those the children of Lot? Amalekites. Oh, uh, Lot and his daughters? No. No? Oh. No. What, did, what happened when the Israelites were brought out of Egypt? The tribe of Amalek. 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 Got came caught in. Dan and those that were at the tail end of the, the group. Right. The people that yeah, were. Yeah, and Amalek, the yes. Yep, caused them right. to be, caused them to, to disbelieve God. Exactly. Amalek. Amalek. And so, yeah, he was supposed to be um fought against not not um entertained as it were because he really caused them to sin against god right to so disbelieve when they were in... right when they were right after coming out of year 400 plus yes, years of the... slavery he attacked them from behind yes at the behind yeah right and um and he did obviously am like did not fear god mm -hmm. so when in fact the scribe goes to write the torah Okay, he's to take his quill and write uh -huh. the word Amalek yeah. somewhere else other than in the, on the Torah and then blot it out uh -huh. before he goes on to write anything else, any other words of the Torah. Because we know mm -hmm. that if he makes a mistake, he has to go all the way back to the beginning and start all over again. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there are those who have come to us via the ages who are said to have the spirit of Amalek. Mm. Anybody name one? Um, Saul. Um, Saul tried to maintain. Um, who was he again? And Samuel killed him. <laughs> and then there was um, yeah, down yeah. in the line with Esther, Monica Hagar. Not, not um, Hagar. Not Hagar. Haman. No. Sorry. Haman. 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 Yes. Ooh, yeah. was said, uh, exactly right. Haman was said to have the spirit of that life. Yeah. And if we come up a little closer in history, more recently. Okay, down in Germany. Yeah. Yeah. Um, who was that? <laughs> um, Adolf. Yes. Hitler. Hitler. Spirit of Amalek. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So, any other questions? Okay, next week we're talking about. Kitabo, this week was when you go out, but this is now when you enter the mm. next week, okay? When you, Kitabo, the next week sentence, set, section, which is Deuteronomy 26. Mm. Okay, just so you know. All right. Um, any questions about that at all? Wow. Wow. <laughs> yes. All right, jump ahead with me. First Kings 18.25. Okay, in your book, this is a section called Proven. Only God is worthy of worship. Amen? Only God. This is 1 Kings 18, uh, 25 through 39 are the verses for today. Oh. And it gives us a memory verse. Yes, yes. And they're always profound. 
Okay, First Kings 18, 25 through 39, but the first, the memory verse in this week's passage is First Kings 18, 21. It starts before our reading, 1821. Anybody want to read that for me? Mike. Mike. Um, from 25 or 21? 21. And Elijah came to all the people and he said, how long will you falter between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. But the people answered him not a word. Wow. Wow. Very interesting. Very, very interesting. Okay. I'm quoting Artie Johnson. Uh, anybody remember Artie? Yeah. yeah. Laughing. Yeah. <laughs> a hundred years ago. Laughing. It just so happened that when I was living in California, one of the ladies on the program with me in the nightclub that my group was performing in was a writer for Latin. Wow. Yeah, exactly. You know, the age thing does way amazing things as we were talking about earlier with all the events of what's going on in England, the you know, passing of the queen. Talk about feeling old. I watched her coronation. Oh, wow is right. <laughs> exactly. I so, waved at her when she came to visit. I was about 12. <laughs> really? Wow. Maybe. Quite a lady. Quite a lady. You know, she talked about consistent. Anyway. I think we'll see her again. Amen. I think she's there with God right now. She I agree. A, I agree. Oh, wow. She's an amazing woman of faith. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, Charles had noted that and, that, uh, and said that he was of the same mind. Mm. So uh, praise God. We'll see what happens. Yes. But here is the focus on the evidences of God's power at work in this story of Elisha, Elijah, and the false prophets. It really is quite an amazing story here. Mm -hmm. okay. But oftentimes... I wish we could pull this up and duplicate it so that people globally could watch what happened here by, by reading this. But again, some people will read this and say, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a wonderful story. Yes. The question is believing it. Okay, we know that the word of God is what? Two-edged sword. Two-edged sword, it is true. And it's there for the purposes of doing what? Is everlasting. Amen. For reproof. Okay. So jump with me then again. Take take a moment and turn to Psalm 83. Psalm 83. And I want you to look at verse 18. Psalm 83, 18. First one there, read that, please. Is it let them be ashamed? Yeah. Okay. Let them be ashamed and dismayed forever. Let them be humiliated and perish. Let right. them be. Uh -huh. okay. Who is the them? I don't read, know. Go back to the beginning of the passage, maybe. Okay. Who, who's he talking about? Nations that conspire against Israel. Nations. Hmm. Okay. Nations specifically. Anybody that denies the anti Yeshua crowd, anti Jesus. Amen. Let them be ashamed and let them perish. To John, Yochanan, John 17, 3. Hmm. Yohanan. Mm. 17.3? Yep. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Amen. 
Amen. Hallelujah. So, um, imagine for a minute, okay, and once we start this, this whole story here about what Elijah did, okay, uh, jump with me to 1 Kings 18, uh, the section that we're reading today, okay, did anybody read it? I read ahead, hopefully. Yeah. Okay, so we know what happened on yeah. this altar that Elijah built. Okay, so imagine yourself on Mount Carmel who witnessed this amazing event. Consider the emotions expressed as they saw God's fire consume everything. What experiences today might cause the same emotions? You know what? Put this on hold for a minute and we'll go back to it. Okay, as we reflect on the story itself. But let's look at first thoughts. First thoughts. Who's got that? It starts companies hiring new employees. I have Diane, a, go ahead. Companies hiring new employees usually want people with related experience. Supervisors want to hire people who have proven track records of success. Many believe that past success is the best indicator of future success. The Bible is filled with demonstrations of God's power. Elijah was an instrument whom God used to display his power. God's past actions assure us of his present and future power. Amen. Amen. So, you know, I'm thinking about his past actions and the Israelites, okay, <laughs> he pulls them out of Egypt. That was a miracle unto itself. The mere fact that, that Moses convinced Pharaoh to let the people go. And again, God could have made that happen one, two, three, quick. But instead, he had all those plagues happen in Egypt. Why? So that Pharaoh and everybody else, including the Israelites, would understand the power of El Shaddai, God mm -hmm. Almighty. Amen? Mm -hmm. He wasn't messing around. So he sent all these different plagues. And finally, the last plague, the death of the firstborn. Amen? Mm -hmm. To make it very clear, I am who I say I am. Or as Moses found out as he was standing in front of the burning bush, he said, mm -hmm. Yud hey vav hey, I will be who I will be. Amen. <clears throat> so should past performance be considered in a job interview? Hmm. Should be. Are we interviewing God? <laughs> so when they went to, when they went through, they <laughs> left Egypt, and the first thing they encountered was the, the, the Pharaoh and his armies chasing after them. So the Lord opened up the sea. Wow. Exactly. Wow. Ooh. Okay, and so they passed through, but they didn't just pass through an open column, they passed through on dry land. Mm -hmm. Talk about miracles. Yeah. And they get to the other side and they say, oh God, you're wonderful. We did all this and the other thing. And then the next day they walk and they're, and they're, they're finding themselves without water. Mm. What did mm. you do? You brought us out here, you're going to kill us. They completely forgot what the Lord had just done. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> Again, let's interview God. What else did he do? He threw a stick in the water and had the water made sweet as opposed to bitter. Okay. Gosh, record. Not only that, but he provided a rock. Mm -hmm. A rock from which water came. Okay. <laughs> Again. Should past performance be considered in a job interview? What do you think? <laughs> well, it's a, it's, I don't know how it even lines up, but uh, I don't think you could have um, a company if you did not have some way to guide yourself into who you're going to bring in. Uh, but I don't know. Uh, God brings everybody in. So... But as far as past performance, I say it has to be. Uh, what are you going to do? 
but that's just my opinion. I don't, I don't see a biblical. It's a good thing that God didn't ask me for my resume. Right. Amen. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Albeit when I stand before him, okay, he's going to say, why should I let you in? Michael. Mm -hmm. When we talk about this, it makes me think of Romans 9, <clears throat> when you mentioned Pharaoh. And it says here, what if God, wanting to show his wrath and to make known his power, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath prepared for destruction, and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had prepared beforehand for glory. That's us. Amen. But he takes time to prepare, you know, nations, people pharaohs for our instruction mm. yeah. there and wasn't one day that died in, from the uh, waters coming back on them they all made it to the other side <laughs> and they sang songs of joy and jubilee on the other side okay uh, praise God uh, horse and rider thrown into the sea mm -hmm. Wow. Lita, you were going to say. Yes. Um, with Back to the performance being considered in a job interview, it, to a point, it, 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 it's what your need is, meaning you need an accountant, somebody who's never really dealt with figures is useless to you, unless you've got a lot of time mm -hmm. to train them and bring them up to speed. So it, it, you know, so it's considered to fit a need, but considered, not necessarily required like i said sometimes you may have the time to bring the person up to speed and you don't mind preparing them and when you because it kind of reminded me of when you said i'm glad god didn't ask me for my resume you know it's like he's bringing us on in his grace but he knows his power to change us <laughs> and his time is limitless yeah mm -hmm. chuck well one other thing he when uh all of us get to heaven and all of us in this room, from what I can tell, are going to be in heaven. Amen. God is going to remind us or we are going to be mindful of the fact that our understanding of how we got in <laughs> sometimes may be um, a little bit clouded. But if the main point is made, we are in. If Jesus is our Savior, we are in. We may think we need more. We may want to change God's rules and so on and so <laughs> forth. But we're going to be there and wake up to a big surprise because we're going to get there and all those ifs, ands, and buts are going to be in the garbage can. And our faith in Jesus is going to be the only thing that meant anything. You know, and it, it, God doesn't hold, God won't even hold our screwed up understanding uh against us he loves us we're saved and that's it and thank then, will the very, then will the very rocks cry out amen amen phenomenal absolutely wonderful amazing yes it is amazing okay for us mere humanoids who have difficulty wrapping our brains around uh much of what god has done okay but we need to dig so deep into understanding his character and what he's doing and what we read in the Old Testament and the Torah about how he's trying to rid ourselves of things that are not worthy of him. Okay, what is sin? Anything that God finds displeasing is sin. Amen. Anything that God finds displeasing is sin. So setting the pace now, okay, um, Again, 1 Kings 16, 29, 18 through 46. Okay. Uh, Could you say that again, please? 1 Kings 16, okay. 29. Okay. Uh, 18 through 46. Okay. Albeit it says, actually, we're going to start on 25. Okay. But um, just to, again, lay a little background here. Ahab. Okay. Mm. Instantly, when I say that name, what comes to mm -hmm. mind? Positive or negative? Negative. Negative. Okay. 
negative. Ahab became king of Israel when his father Amri died. And he was evil and he married this lady named Jezebel. Jezebel. Oh. Double, double evil. <laughs> okay. Uh, she was a Sidonian princess and a devout Baal worshiper. And he even built an, order, an altar for Baal in Samaria. Elijah, who was the Tishbite, appeared on the scene and informed Ahab that no dew or rain would fall in Israel without the prophet's authorization. Elijah hid himself from Ahab, Ahab at the brook Cherit, east of Jordan River, and the Lord sent ravens to bring him food. God then sent Elijah to Zarephath, Zarephath near Sidon, where the widow provided uh, for him. The trusted Elijah's promise, okay, the, the widow running out for food, actually. But God provided her with needs when she trusted Elijah's promise. Later, the widow's son became sick and died. But God used Elijah to raise the child from the dead. God commanded Elijah to go meet King Ahab the third year after Elijah's announcement. Ahab had sent a man named Obadiah to seek water and vegetation in the land. And Elijah met him and told him to tell Ahab Elijah would appear to him soon. Obadiah feared for his life because he knew Ahab did not like Elijah. However, Elijah assured Obadiah that he would appear to the king that day. Elijah told Ahab that he had brought trouble on himself by forsaking God's commands. And the prophet encouraged him to bring the prophets of Baal and Asherah to Mount Carmel for divine showdown. Again, Baal, worshipers, Asherah. Remember, we hear, you always hear about Asherah poles. They were like totem poles. Chuck, go ahead. No, God was instilling confidence into Elijah. Oh, what amazes me is chapter 19, but going into chapter 18, Elijah had to have confidence in God and not only confidence, not only, not only that, he had to know for sure that he was the instrument of God to bring about the things that he told the widow, the things that he told this guy that was the king's servant, and even the things that he told the king with Regard God, God didn't just honor Elijah's word. Elijah just proclaimed God's word. There's not going to be rain. The widow is not going to die. The oil is going to keep flowing and so on and so forth. And then comes, you know, this, what is going to happen that you're going to go into now. Yeah. Elijah was confident, but not only confident in that he had this knowledge. Confident that he was only proclaiming what God had already said is going to happen. It was going to happen no matter Very, what. End of story. And end Chuck, of story. But, when, when I wrote down my, in my, when I was reading in front of verse 25, the beginning here, okay, then Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, since you are so numerous, okay, he's beginning his instructions here, okay, the first thing I wrote down is with great confidence. <laughs> okay, I mean, he was totally, absolutely sure that the Lord was with him and the Lord was using him the same way that he used Rav Shaul, Paul. Okay, least likely to use him because he had previously been killing followers of the way. But be that as it may, let me finish that. Elijah told Ahab that he had brought trouble on himself by forsaking God's commands. The prophet encouraged him to bring the prophets of Baal and a share at the Mount Carmel for a divine showdown. Talk about a street fight. Here it was. Following the contest on Mount Carmel, Elijah told Ahab that rain was coming soon. The prophet waited at Top Carmel as he sent his servant seven times to look to the sea for signs of the coming rain. God sent rain at last, and as Ahab rode his chariot to Jezreel. Okay, so again, you know, Ahab, talk about stiff-necked people, okay? Didn't get it. That being the case, let's jump over to verse 25. What does it say? 
Who's got it? Yeah. Anybody? First 25. 1825. Then Elijah, Elijah said, Go ahead, Mark. Oh, thank you. Now Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, Choose one bowl for yourselves and prepare it first, for you are many, and call on the name of your God, but put no fire under it. Okay. All right. So, uh, read, read 26 also. So they took the bowl, which was given them, and they prepared it and called on the name of Baal from morning until noon, saying, Oh, Baal, hear us. But there was no voice. No one answered. Then they okay. leaped about the altar, which they had made. Okay. So Elijah suggested that perhaps his, his, his nothing had happened here. Okay. Um, that... You know, maybe maybe uh, Bale was asleep. Okay, uh, Chuck, sir. Well, now I don't have it in front of me, but someday you have to just uh, look at how they say this in the message translation. <laughs> okay, I'll let you do it on your own. Don't do it now. <laughs> okay. Yeah, the message is is an interesting paraphrase. Okay, um, but. The contest was about to begin here, and Elijah addressed the prophets of Baal, uh, and he requests Ahab to summon 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of Asherah. And they confirmed that at least 450 of them actually showed up. Uh, but he said, you're, you're, you're too numerous. Choose for yourself a bull, prepare it, put it on the altar. Okay, he invited Baal prophets to call on the name of your God, small g. But he said, don't light the fire. <laughs> Baal would have to reveal his power by igniting his own sacrifice. Since Baal was considered both sun god and storm god, the contest rules provided him with a perceived advantage. So it jumps into 26 and it says, they called Baal they said, Baal, answer us. But there was no sound. No one answered. They danced around the altar. Can you picture this? Okay. Um, the word dance here translates as the same word as being waver. Waver. It literally means limped. And many refer to Baal prophets doing a ritual dance around the altar. And they were doing all that they could to implore Baal's response, but nothing was working, and I wonder why. And Elijah knew, he knew that their efforts would prove futile. And he probably intended his mocking to help the people who were watching appreciate the futility of the Baal prophets and everything that they were doing. First, he says, shout loudly. You're not shouting loudly enough. Okay. He is, for he He's your God. Then he said, he said, maybe thinking this over a little bit, he said, uh, he was raising the idea that maybe he hadn't made up his mind as to what to do yet, Baal, okay? Secondly, Elijah suggested that maybe he had wandered away. He was suggesting that maybe he went to relieve himself. Okay, okay. Notice how Elijah suggested put Baal in human terms. Pagan, pagan people assumed that gods were like them. Thirdly, he suggested, maybe he's on the road. Maybe he had left the region and they needed to wait for his return. <laughs> and fourthly, he suggested that perhaps he's sleeping and he just hadn't woke. And the prophets shouted loudly. They even cut themselves with knives and spears. Okay, something that was, you know, actually customary back then. They were beginning to recognize the desperate situation as the time went on. This went on all day. And all afternoon, the prophets kept, kept on raving. Okay, these false prophets called words into an empty heaven. And their desperate calling continued until the time of the offering of the sacrifice was over. Okay, twilight. No one answered. No one paid attention. They called all day. Okay, let's read. 
uh, 27 on, 27 to 29. And so it was at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, cry aloud for he is a God. Either he is meditating or he's busy or he's on a journey or perhaps he's sleeping and you must awaken him. So they cried aloud and cut themselves as was their custom with knives and lances until the blood gushed out of them. And when midday was passed, they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, but there was no voice, no one answered, no one paid attention. So all false gods lead to disappointment and emptiness, okay? And so bloody mess. If, if somebody is false gods or no god, Okay, when somebody, you know, testifies the fact that they're uh, an atheist, that's their religion, atheism. All right, Where did, what did that do for you recently? Okay, um, the Baal prophets worshiped God and did not exist. He held only the power ascribed to him. Today, many people of the world worship false gods. One day they'll discover these gods that are powerless in addition, many worship other gods such as money, fame, power, and these also ultimately will not provide lasting satisfaction. Only a relationship with God that involves worship of him will provide lasting fulfillment. Can I hear an amen? Amen. So, which begs the question, how should the lack of any response impact a person's belief about something or someone that they worship? If you're worshiping something or someone, money, something, and there is no response, what more things other than God as their highest priority? Name something, anything. Can you think of somebody? Can you think of somebody that you might have shared with who is completely thinking you're half a bubble off a plum? Well, when people tell me that they're agnostic, I got more respect for them than the atheists because at least they're admitting they know nothing. But yeah, or well, they're suggesting that there is a God or some yeah. higher power. You're right. Okay. You're right, That's Mike. I remember one time saying when somebody said I'm an agnostic, I said, Great. That's great. <laughs> You're not an atheist. <laughs> at least be honest. Yeah, at least be honest. That's where my father was. <laughs> but then. It was admitted to me by my sister, who was in a conversation. I wasn't present. She was, my sister and her husband were talking to my father. And my father, who was just on the precipice of disappearing into the doldrums of Alzheimer's, said to them, and they were talking about faith, I like where Peter is. Because I had shared with them about Jesus. Mm. And... Uh, I mean, again, I caught that second hand. Ultimately, I know where my father is. But, um, uh, well, in recovery, in our recovery work, and I do quite a bit of recovery work, uh, the wonderful thing about Celebrate Recovery and the stuff that we're doing is we instruct, we encourage, and we um, testify to the fact that there is only one higher power and there's exactly. only one his name is jesus he is almighty god there's mm -hmm. only one there's not two and they these guys are going to find out firsthand in this story that there is only one but i'm jewish yeah <laughs> same god just get to know him better yeah well hero israel the lord their god the lord is one shema yisrael adonai elohinu adonai echad Echad, meaning one, meaning a God that's made up of multiple parts. Yeah. A one God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen? All in one. Okay, as you said, Chuck, there's only one God. Okay, so um, anyway, Elijah, they, they put together this altar. They put the bull on the altar. Elijah said, don't light the fire because Baal should be able to light the fire himself. Amen. So uh, Elijah, 
uh, repaired the Lord's altar that had been torn down oh, with all this ranting and raving and cutting and craziness. The, the altar kind of been torn down. The altar likely came from an earlier time. King Solomon completed the temple in Jerusalem before the people entered the land. God instructed them to worship him in the only place that he would choose not to build altars on every hill. However, in this context and in this contest was a special instance through which God was using his prophet to establish his presence in the northern kingdom. Again, at this point, the Israel was divided to, into two sections, north in Israel and in Yehuda, Judah, in the southern section. Okay, a kingdom that had turned away from him. The prophet of the Lord worked carefully and deliberately. Elisha took 12 stones, according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob. And by doing so, Elijah was anchoring his altar to Israel's history. When God's people crossed the Jordan River in the days of Joshua, Joshua had built a memorial altar by the Jordan and in the Jordan, each with 12 stones. These altars represented Israel's unity. Its 12 tribes were entering the land as one people. And perhaps Elijah using 12 stones again anticipated the day when God would unite the kingdoms of Israel and Judah again into one country under God. Amen. So why did the people need to re be reminded of God's covenant? And do people need the same reminder today? Yes, constantly. What's an evidence of the fact that we may need to be reminded today? The fact that we stray. I mean, when, when something happens amazing, we're all focused. But sadly, 9-11, you know, when that happened, churches were packed. People yep. could not find church fast enough to go there and... and what's and, today's date, Kalita? That's, that's what, <laughs> what came to mind. It's like um, people were running into a safe place and they saw a safe place as church. But when everybody got back to their day-to-day, -day, the church attendance dropped off. We, we forget. Like you were saying with Israel, it's like we just walked through on dry ground. And days later, you brought us here to die. You know, yep. We are so easily, easy to forget, so easily distracted. What other reminders do we have? Thank God for his word. What is, what, is the first, what is the first thing that God made the holy and sanctified? Genesis. What is the first thing that he made holy? Sabbath. The Sabbath. Okay. Does that happen how often times, how many times a year? 52. 52. Do you think we need to be reminded on a weekly basis? Okay. You're supposed to through Friday. Amen. That's what it says. But on the Sabbath, you rest in the Lord. Amen. Okay, it doesn't mean that you go out and get drunk. Okay, it doesn't mean that you go out and do some other craziness. You're supposed to spend time with him and rest. Hallelujah. If he needed that, we need that. Amen. So we are a stiff-necked people. And we, uh, we constantly need to be prodded. Welcome to Humanity 101. <laughs> oh, geez. It, it staggers my mind how fast we forget. You know, the Lord will do something. Susan was talking about the whole business with uh, Jameson Jr. Okay? And how amazing that is. And there are other stories that happen. So every week, there are God things. That's why I ask it when we start Tell me about any guide sightings that you might have. They happen around us continuously, continuously. But we need to recognize those things and realize that he's forever at work in all of us. So Elisha built an altar with the stones in the name of the Lord. His careful preparation heightened in the importance of his work. Some presence might have feared that he would not have enough daylight to finish the task and, God, but, um, and, God, and call on God. But, I love that word in scripture, but God, 
Elijah's actions demonstrated his faith. And once he completed the altar, he would not need much time. Okay, so let's read. Where do we leave off? 30? 30 right. through 35, Michael. Then Elijah said to all the people, come near to me. So all the people came near to him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. And Elijah took 12 stones, according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, to whom the Lord, the word of the Lord had come, saying, Israel shall be your name. Then with the stones, he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench around it large enough to hold two <coughs> seas of seed. Four gallons. Okay. okay. And he put the wood, <coughs> excuse me, and he put the wood in order cut the bowl in pieces, and laid it on the wood, and said, fill four water pots with water, and pour it on the burnt offering and on the wood. Then he said, do it a second time. And they did it a second time. He said, do it a third time. And they did it a third time. So the water ran all around the altar, and he also it also filled the trench with water. So Elijah's instructions to the people, okay, fill the pots with water, pour it on the offering, Okay, if in fact you're trying to create a fire, do you pour water on it, on what you're about to burn? When you go out and pull wood for the fire, do you grab green wood? <laughs> okay. And think they're in the middle of a drought. In How precious middle. is that water? Yeah, exactly. So verse 35 describes the water ran all around the altar. Elisha still was not finished. He even filled the trench with water. Filling the trench with water would have further restrained whatever water was draining from the sacrifice. We have to remember, as we read this account, that Elijah had not yet experienced this grand outcome. His heart, he had the confidence, Chuck, his God would win. Even if the sacrifice was doused with water, he glorified God by trusting his power. And we, we honor God when we express trust in his power. Amen. You were going to say, Chuck. Well, um, we have to get ready to get going, but I, I want to say this. I know it's brought up in the lesson, but if you can only imagine, it says all the people. I mean, the, the people in the vicinity of this taking place had heard about what was taking place. I guarantee you every man, woman, and child that lived within whatever miles was there to watch what was going to happen here because they wanted to see what was going to happen. Their minds had been confused with all these foreign gods, but God wanted every one of them to see his power. I can only imagine the conversions or the rededications to God that happened that day must have been like 99.9%. All the other ones must have either died or been vegetables. I don't know, but I'll guarantee you that God wanted to reveal himself to the people who were wondering which God is God. You know, the prophets of the foreign, of the other G-O-Ds that were uh, small Gs, um, God didn't, well, we're gonna read it, but they didn't survive, but all the people survived and watched and more than likely uh, the conversion, uh, radical conversion took place in the hearts and minds of countless thousands that day. Uh, it, it's a wonderful, uh, uh, revelation of the love of God for mankind. What a wonderful, extreme way to see the power of God uh, we're going to hear about. You know, just wonderful. I know uh, I'm having this image of you gathering all of your people, Chuck, for a baptismal thing on the beach in Fort Lauderdale. Okay, but we put out an announcement that God's going to show up here and we reenact this. That was a vision, okay? Wouldn't it be great if we could build an altar, sacrifice an ox, a bull, okay? Pour water all over it and watch God lap it up. Do you think we'd have some conversions? So, again, when we're looking to God for something great, how should we re prepare to receive the answer that he has for us. 
We're looking for God to, and we're for trying to prepare for something great. We're looking to him for something. Don't doubt. What? Don't doubt. James says it. Don't doubt. Just expect it. Be, be in a great expectation. It's going to happen. Don't doubt. Doubt your doubts. Believe your beliefs. God can do anything. Amen. Amen. And it, but at the same time, remember that his answer may not be what we want. Right? Or what we expect. Yeah. Or what we expect. <laughs> right. He may have a different thing in mind altogether. All right. But it usually would be better than what we were thinking of. Amen. Well, that's why Romans 8.28 is Romans 8.28. You know, God's purpose is God's purpose, and all things that he does work out for the good of us. They are either going to build our faith or reveal him to us. Something is going to happen good, even though it may not be the way that we wanted it to happen. Something good in our lives is going to be the result. We just have a couple more verses, Chuck. Can we read it before you run off? Sure. Yes? Okay. Uh, Michael, go ahead. 36 to 39. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel, and I am your servant, and that I've done all these things at your word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that you are the Lord God, and that you have turned their hearts back to you again. Then the fire of God fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice. Amen. And the wood and the stones and the dust, and it licked up the water that was in the trench. Now, when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. Amen. And Elijah said to them, Seize the prophets of Baal. That's and it. Not let them escape. That's it, Mike. Yeah. Don't they let fell stay. on their face and said, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. Okay, there were some conversions that day. There were, that, that was right. revival right there. Move from here to here. All right. So, again, and Chuck, I, I don't want to hold you up if you have to go. But uh, obviously, we, we appreciate your presence. presence. Okay. Um, but God is still seeking humble servants who will worship him above all else. Okay, above all else, can you understand what that means to you? Okay, how would you change your existence knowing that he's seeking servants who will worship him above everything else in your life? The fire fell and consumed the bird's offering. However, God's mighty fire uh, that it consumed the wood, the stones, the dust, it licked up the water in the trench. The fire was hot and it burned the wood, but also evaporated the stones the stones, the word translated lick, comes up as a Hebrew word that sounds like the word lick and provides a vivid image of what happened. God's mighty action put a powerful exclamation on his supremacy over Israel. And his heavenly fire consumed the sacrifice and everything associated with it. His power vastly exceeded Baal's. And at that point, there was no question. Amen. Amen. When all, all the people saw it, they fell face down. They had witnessed the amazing power and demonstration from God Almighty, and they knew to humble themselves at once. Wow. They responded in amazement at God's power as they affirmed the Lord. He is God. The Lord, he is God. Okay. So when God responded and Baal did not, the people knew that the Lord and not Baal was their God. And their fervent affirmation affirmed that sentiment. Amen? Amen. So God had called, lastly, him to a prophetic ministry. And God had provided for him. You got to remember, he didn't rehearse this. He didn't spend hours through the course of the night like we used to do for pageant into the middle of the night rehearsing hour after hour to try to show people something. Okay, again, Chuck had the confidence, said he had the confidence in knowing that the Lord was going to do exactly what he was going to do. God had provided for him uh, every step of Elijah's journey. God had protected him from King Ahab, and God soon would protect him from Jezebel. 
uh, Ahab's evil, underlying evil wife. Elijah's goal was not to exalt himself, but to exalt God, that all Israel might know him. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. And uh, one point that I, I think I picked up, I just I want to get your um, uh, understanding. Uh, the Jews looked at the book of Elijah as a history book, not as a prophecy book. Is that right? Well, he is. They he said is, their section he is written I the prophet. This, this supposedly fell into the history. But uh, whatever. Uh, you know, we've all seen God uh, do miracles in our lives. Miracles are miracles. We've all seen them. I hope that... Uh, I can be encouraged to be all in, no matter what. Trust my Lord, trust God, uh, no matter what. You know, I'll just tell you this. We've been away with family and friends for a couple of weeks. There is nothing, nothing like the family of God. I saw God work when I was up there. It was wonderful. But what a breath of fresh air to be with you guys right now, right here in this place. God Amen. is wonderful. Uh, so I thank God for you guys. Hope you have a good week. I have to go, but uh, I love yeah. you all. God bless you. Bye-bye for now. Chuck, who's the family member we should pray for? My cousin, my nephew, Sam. Okay. Definitely. okay. Definitely. He he knows he's okay. being drawn by God. He said those very words. Uh -huh. uh, so thank you. Hallelujah. Thank you. Have a beautiful day. And just as God. a quick note, Elijah, we set a table, set a place setting for him at the Passover table. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Okay, because yeah. we know he, he, his presence will precede the coming of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Can't wait to meet him. Gonna Amen. meet him that day, Peter, or one day before, but I can't wait Hallelujah. to meet him. Bye bye. Okay, well, Chuck. Thank you, Chuck. Okay. Wow. So today, God is still seeking his humble servants who will worship him above all else. As we do so, we can lead others in that same direction. Amen. And used by our words or by our example, God is eager to use available, willing believers who desire to see his glory demonstrated. And they find their own fulfillment in doing his will. Scripture affirms con consistently that God can do extraordinary things through ordinary people who choose to trust him. And all I can think about is our friend Jameson's son, Jameson Jr., clinging to a noodle in the ocean, saying after his leg had been bitten off, Jesus will save me. Amen. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> okay, prayer requests. God bless you all if you are joining with us. Okay, and watching Rabbi and Friends, please join us again. Okay, love to have you with us. God bless you. We've gathered to worship here in the house of the risen sun.